I know when I, I read through the Psalms where a man after God's own heart, he said, in God will I praise his word. And if a, some people say, oh, you're bibliolatry, you're putting too much about the word, that is impossible. You can't. Yeah, right. And when God magnified it above his own name, yeah. we can't put it high enough. And that's why I really appreciate this conference where God's word isn't undermined. It's not the yea hath God said or a better translation would be. My professor told me and I believe him. But God's word being the final authority and it's one that we have. We have it in our hands and we can utilize it for the glorification of Christ Jesus. And I am extremely thankful and grateful that I was able to come here. And thanks, Brother Paul, for your, your zeal provoking many. I appreciate it much. My, my topic is about the family. And how many people um, have seen godly families and stuff like, or even just families in general, not under attack? I don't know of anyone that's not under attack. I mean, you, when Satan sees the potential of children growing up like Timothy, from a child knowing those holy scriptures, able to make them wise unto salvation, where they can go on and be fit for the battle, Satan does not want that. It's a very, very damaging element. And that's a good thing. We need more damaging elements for Satan and his plan. So I'm going to look at a few things regarding the family. And I really appreciate Brother Paul's message has had. I was going to say it's gold, but that wasn't gold. It was gold, silver, and precious stones. It's that stuff that gets you through the, the judgment seat of Christ. And it's that stuff that Paul in 2 Corinthians 5, I believe it is, where he said he's grown into be clothed upon with his house that is from heaven. And I love seeing that picture where David... He's laying up gold and silver and all those precious things for a plan and purpose to glorify God and have a place on the earth where God's word and his power and magnific magnificence would be, be able to be launched off from there for the greatest glory of God. So I want to start with going over to 1 Chronicles. 1 Chronicles, we mentioned about in 1 Corinthians 3, 9, ye are God's building, ye are God's husbandry in his house. But in 1 Chronicles, David is getting prepped. He's getting his heart, his heart's in the right direction, and he's laying up very important and precious materials in preparation for a building project. In 1 Chronicles, chapter 29. 1 Chronicles 29. And we'll start with verse number 11. Second, or 1 Chronicles 29, 11. So here's David, it says, Wherefore, verse number 10, Wherefore David blessed the Lord before all the congregation, and David said, Blessed be thou, Lord God of Israel, out, or our Father forever and ever. Thine, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty for all that is in the heaven and in the earth. And in the earth is is thine, sorry, my pages are getting a little smeared. I should have grabbed my other Bible. <laughs> are thine, I think that's an excuse for eyesight depletion, but anyway. He said, all thine, and is the, the kingdom, O Lord, and thou art exalted head above all. Both riches and honor come of thee, and thou reignest over all. And in thine hand is power and might, and in thy hand it is to make great and to give strength unto all. Therefore, our God, we thank thee and praise thy glorious name. So here's the, the heart's desire of David. But look with me at verse number one of the same chapter. David, in preparation, he says, verse number two, 1 Chronicles 29, verse two. He said, now I have prepared with all my, what? Might. All my might for the house of my God. And what did he lay up? Look at the latter part of verse two. You see the precious stones, the marble in abundance, and those very, very valuable building materials. And verse number three says, Moreover, because I set my affections to, no, affection to build. Now, the thing about building, families are a building. It's a habitation. It's a place where children can be nurtured, edified. It's a place where a godly woman and godly man have a goal and a purpose to bring forth that fruit from their marriage relationship, to train them and nurture them, and ideally to set a living epistle example that those children can see and say, hmm, that's exactly what I want to be when I get older. So this thing about in preparation with all his might, he didn't have a double-mindedness, I'm doing this and I'm doing that. With singleness of heart, he put his value and assets in prep. He put his, his riches where his mouth was. 
And the next generation that he laid up for, Solomon took those things. And in Solomon's mind, his mind that was transferred from David, a man after God's own heart, Solomon's plan was that after he would build that, it would be something wonderful, great for the glory of God. And that's why I love this conference. The whole thing that I've noticed has been for the purpose that our house that is from heaven is going to be wonderful, great to glorify God for all eternity. And the focus being on that, it's not focused on men. It's not focused on that. It's focused on God's word and the glorification of it. And the truth, I mean, you might forget who preached what thing, but you remember the truth of the word. And you might forget the messenger, but the message remains. So I'm very, very thankful for that. Now, turn with me, if you would, over to a man that was on display. In, turn with me to Job chapter 23. And you remember Job being that spectacle onto angels and onto men, as it were. Yep. God, you know, there was that, man, that time where the God, I forgot how it says, but in, Gen, in Job 1, how the sons of God came before the Lord and Satan came also amongst them. Yep. And what did God say to Satan? He said, Hast thou considered my servant Job? And when God says a perfect and an upright man, one that fears God and is true with evil, that's God's words coming out about what Job did. But here's some things about what Job did. Let's turn with me to Job chapter 23. Here's Job. He laid up in preparation for hard times to come. And his heart was in the right direction. In Job chapter 23, and we'll see what comes... Uh, before a man is mentioned as being perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and is true with evil. Job 23, look with me at verse 15. Job 23, 15. Uh, well, look at verse 12. He says, Neither have I gone back from the commandment of his lips. I have esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. But he, and then look at verse 13. But he is in one mind, and who can turn him? We just heard about the mind of Christ. And if you have that mind of Christ, you're in that one mind. Here comes some shipwreck type of substances and things like that. You can avoid it through that mind of Christ carrying you through those temptations, allowing the word of God to fortify and strengthen you. So here's Job, a man after God's own heart, and he's on display and he's being talked about in the heavenly places. And Satan knew that he was up against somebody. And as those hard times came against Job, he didn't all of a sudden say, well, quick, I got to start esteeming God's word more than my necessary food. He did that in preparation before it ever came. And as it came, he could come through those trials and tribulation at the end of that thing. And he could say, naked came I into this world and naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all these things, it says God, he, he charged, he, neither did Job sin with his mouth nor charge God foolishly. And I thought the reason he could do that and come through is the words of God's mouth were elevated even more than his necessary food. And he wanted to have a hedge of protection around his family. Now, I think about these hedges and protection. When you think about the giants, like um, that was talked about last night, about the different strongholds. When the, Cap the Philistines, they came from the of Cap island of Captor. They came on board and they started fortifying themselves. And they started making themselves fortresses with exceeding high walls. And these giants, you think, well, if you're a giant, why do you need an exceeding high wall? What are you afraid of? But Satan was trying to make sure that here comes some of those conquests that was coming through Joshua and David, and you're trying to have them be fortified against them, and pff, none of those walls were going to hold up. And you see just like what happened with Jericho. But they were afraid, and they wanted to make sure that they were prepared. But th that, let that be a lesson to us to be in preparation for hard times when they come. Now, turn with me over. Well, we won't go there because it's going to take too long. But this thing about being a skilled laborer, Everyone remember old Bezalel in the Old Testament? He was filled with wisdom and might from God. And what did he build with? He would craft and was an artificer of brass and of gold and of silver, precious things. And he would bring down into a physical realm and make them out of something that was a picture or an image of the heavenly places. And he would craft and he would skillfully work with those things. It's the same way that we need to build as whether it be if you're a husband or you're a grandfather or a young, young little lad, maybe in preparation to be a father someday, or even if you're never going to be married, to be an encouragement to a possible father or a grandfather, but to be in preparation and realize there is a goal and purpose for Satan in this world, and there's a goal and purpose for God, and we can be prepared for it. I don't, for sake of time, let's 
I think we have enough time to go over here. Go with me over to Nehemiah, Nehemiah chapter 4. As you get your heart and mind engaged in gear, and you, have a, you set your mind to work, right away you have, just like Nehemiah ran into, you got Tobiah, Sanballat and Tobiah, and right away they start giving opposition and resistance. And the resistance started ramping up more and more. And when the little resistance that they first started wasn't enough, they started getting violent, and the resistance and the oppression got even greater and greater and greater. So Nehemiah chapter number four. And the resistance that Nehemiah ran into got so bad that as they worked, they had to be armed. They'd have a trowel in one hand and a sword in the other hand. And that reminds me exactly of today. As you're out there laboring for Christ Jesus, you run into infidels that graduated from theological seminaries. They don't believe God's word. They've been trained from their youth to be gainsayers and to spread disinformation and, and ungodliness. But they're multiplying rapidly because their minds have been darkened. And that's why this book can lighten them up and give them understanding that they don't have so they can be transformed from that darkness to light. Amen. All right. Here I'm sitting here. I need to be able to do two things at once. I was thinking about that message going over here. I need to be able to talk and turn to my verse I'm going to come to. So anyway, I'm getting a little extra color in my face here. Uh, let me see here. Okay. All right, here we go. Nehemiah 4. Okay. I need got an extra color now on my face. All right, Nehemiah 4. And uh, let's look at verse 2. Here's some of the resistance coming against him. First, they had a mind to build. They're, they're going to set up. They're going to start building that wall around that city and having it prepared. They're going to fortify it. And he says, And he spake before his brethren in the army of Samaria and said, What do these feeble Jews, will they, what, fortify themselves? So as soon as you're fortifying yourself, you got God's word and you got a mind to build, here comes resistance that you need to be fortified to meet that opposition. He says, they for, will they fortify themselves? Will they sacrifice? Will they make an end in one day? Will they receive the stones out of the heaps and rubbish, uh, rubbish which, which are burned? So it goes down here farther. Look at verse number six. In the latter part of verse six, it says, for the people had a what to work? A mind, that mind of Christ that we can have to build and build on that right foundation as a type what Nehemiah was building with. And he's going down here and, and they start running into more opposition. And look at verse number seven. It says, it came to pass that when Sanballat and Tobiah and the Arabians and the Ammonites and the Ashdodites heard that the walls of Jerusalem uh, were made up and that the breaches began to be stopped, they were very wroth. Oh, so Satan's plan is like, no, I don't want them building. I want to make sure that the, the building and the plan is put to an end and stopped because once they fortify themselves, they're going to be a foe that's going to be harder to overthrow. And this, in this world, we need families that have fortifications around them, that hedges around them, with godly husbands and godly fathers who understand the wiles of the devil. They're not ignorant concerning his devices. And they have an understanding of what God did in time past. They know this book from front to back. I met one guy one time. He goes, I know the Bible. I read it from front to cover. I said, well, then you're definitely going to know this. And I asked him a few questions. But to be able to know what God's will is. And this flesh, it doesn't matter if it lived 2,000 years ago or it's going to live 400 years in the future. It all has the same temptations. Exactly. In 1 John 2.15, the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, the pride of life. It's the same old ammunition, same old tackle box Satan uses from generation to generation. And it works as long as the mind stays darkened. But when you have that illumination and that one mind starts working, you can realize and strip away a temptation and say, this is the same old junk. I know exactly where it's going and instead of falling prey. Amen. So a protection around families, having an understanding where temptations are for young women, where are temptations for young men, and what the goal and purpose for young men and young women are. So you look at today, what do they do? They mongrelize youngsters' minds. They don't know where they came from. They don't know where they're going. They're all confused as could be, so they can just be manipulated and played like a cheap harmonica for the confusion and operation of Satan. If you go to, with your Bibles over to 1 Samuel 14, in 1 Samuel 14, there was a mind to work. 
there were some men who had their minds set up and they're like, you know what? We're going to go and try something. And the Lord is the one that wrought the victory. But there was first a willing mind. So in 1 Samuel 14, I love this example. And I love the phraseology in here. 1 Samuel 14. And look with me at verse number. Uh, we'll start with 11. So here's the Philistines. And it's Jonathan and his armor bearer are out there. And they're going to start doing something for the Lord. They're going to fight against his host. It says... Both of them discovered themselves under the garrison of the Philistines. And the Philistines said, Behold, the Hebrews are come forth out of the holes where they had hid themselves. Now, there were no threat. As long as you stay in the hole, I don't want. And right away, when you start mentioning people about sin, righteous judgment to come in God's plan. Oh, that's judging me. You get right back in that hole and be quiet. I like you a whole lot better when you're all quiet. Now you're judging me. Like um, uh, Lot, when he starts rebuking the people of Sodom and Gomorrah. Oh, brethren, do not so wickedly. Then they said, this man came to sojourn, and will he be a judge over us? And the vitriol and upsetment welled up in them, and they said, now will we deal worse with you than with them? Because he started telling them what they're doing was not right. And that's why we need to have this book do that for us every single day. We open it up, and it's that mirror, it's that light, and it says, hey, you've got this, this, and this wrong, and you say, ah, oh, thanks for letting me see it, and but this thing is a discerner of the thoughts. And all these temptations, they start with the thought. And it's a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And it can make us wise unto salvation, not just eternal life, but wise unto the life of Christ dwelling in us. So these things, they, they come out of their holes. The Philistines start getting nervous. And then you look what happens. God wins a great victory. And it says, look at verse number 15. And there was a trembling in the host in the field among all the people in the garrison. And that's what we need to be. We need to be that trembling force where we, number one, tremble at God's word. And with a heart of belief, we take that book, apply it to our lives for the greatest glory of God and go out in this present world and work and live with that truth. So this, this thing about being armed and fit for the battle is so important. Understanding your adversaries and understanding your enemy and being prepared for it and being ready. If you take your Bible and turn to 1 Timothy 6. 1 Timothy 6. So the Philistines and Satan's plan, he wants to keep you under his thumb. He wants to keep your mind darkened. He wants you to just be sitting there, just maybe running on a little spiritual gerbil wheel. Whew, look at all this stuff I'm doing. And you're accomplishing that. You're not going anywhere. You're not serving the Lord with wisdom and understanding and knowledge. But at 1 Timothy 6, there's a laying up. You know, you've no doubt heard where... When Rockefeller died, they asked how much he left behind. Everything. Everything he, all that wealth and stuff and dishanded stuff that he was doing, he couldn't take any of it with him. And when he talks about we brought nothing into this world and it's certain we can carry nothing out. You got stores, it's carry out only or something. You take it and you go out. This world is carry out. But there's something you can invest that goes beyond where God allows it to be placed in the heavenly places and it's able to be Sealed until the day of redemption for his use. So first Timothy, and again, I gotta get over them sitting here and talking instead of going. Okay, first Timothy six. And we'll start reading at verse number 17. First Timothy 6, 17. It says, Charge them that are rich in this world that they be not high-minded, nor trust in uncertain riches. I mean, can anyone verify and validate that today? Yeah. With it's just craziness going on. Yeah. But investing in the certain riches, neither trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who giveth us richly all things to enjoy. Amen. They that do good, uh, that they do good and that they be rich in good works, ready to distribute, willing to communicate, laying up in store. That's exactly what uh, uh, Job did. He laid up in store and prepared and was praying and getting his family prepared and having a hedge about them, but laying up in store... Uh, for themselves a good foundation against the time to come, that they may lay hold on eternal life. O Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust, avoiding profane and vain babblings in opposition of science, falsely so called. And we just saw that a whole bunch in the last few years. Oh, yeah, right. Which some profess in themselves have erred concerning the faith. Uh, grace be with thee. Amen. But laying up and having a, an opportunity to take that truth and lay it up because that's where it's going to be safe. 
Now, if you go with me over to, um, let's go to, well, we, we don't have to go. You're probably familiar with it. But in Hebrews chapter 3, in verse number 12, it talks about an evil heart of unbelief. And if you remember when Caleb and Joshua, you've got those 10 spies, and they said they looked around, and instead of God's word in their heart, the evil heart of unbelief said, oh. Look, they, they take their binoculars and they're looking around. And they said, ah, the land, it swallowed up another one. The land, it devoureth the inhabitants. Right away, instead of saying, we be well able, what comes out of Caleb and Joshua's mouth? That we saw the land and there are going to be bread for us. It's no problem. We be well able. So with the belief of God's word, it didn't matter what they saw. They knew that they were well able because they believed what God told them. And they were willing to do whatever it took, and they knew God was going to bring the victory. So they had that willing mind, and the other ones had the evil heart of unbelief. And when people have an, un, an evil heart of unbelief toward this word, you don't grow. You're dwarfed. You're not able to build the hedge. You're not allowed to prepare and lay forward or being able to set provisions ahead for the next generation. You get robbed and... Before you know it, it's like that besieged city that somebody mentioned about where they're eating asses, heads, and doves dung. And I'm not interested in having that on my menu when I got these meaty things of God's word. So if they want the asses, heads, and doves dung buffet, count me out because I'm, I'm not interested in going that direction. So anyway, uh, if you take your Bibles and turn with me over to Psalm chapter number one. So I want to look at a few things regarding what would make a strong husband... What would make a strong future husband, as a little lad, what he should do? So in Psalm chapter 1, David had his issues, but he had a heart toward God. He didn't go whoring after those false gods like Saul, Solomon did, but he had his heart perfect toward God, and when he failed, he was able to allow God's word to get him back up where he needed to be. So in Psalm chapter 1, it says, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night, just like Job, esteeming the words of his mouth more than his necessary food. And he should be like a tree planted by the rivers of water, which bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. But the ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind driveth away. The ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. The Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish." So this man, a godly man, was able to see the seed of the scornful and not have anything to do with it. He would shun it and turn away from that and not be influenced by it. There are influences in this world that if you give a little heed to them, they have images. I am going to look later on about in Numbers 33, 52, where as Israel was coming through the land, God said for them, destroy all their, does anyone remember? Pictures. They had stuff they set up in pictograph form in images that they had that were vile and corrupt and just people looking on it would get their hearts to go the wrong direction and they'd become shipwrecked. And before you know it, it would taint and corrupt them and weaken their conscience to start being tolerant toward sacrificing their own children yeah. to devils. Right. And you think, no way. There's no way that someone would do that. Even us here today, would anyone think one or two generations removed from you that your children could be doing that? You think that would never happen to me. But every one of us need to take heed lest we fall. Right. Let him that thinketh he standeth, this stuff here is no good and it has to be subject to this book or you will tolerate things that you don't realize are going to be so detrimental for the next generation or the next. You're going to say, oh, why did I not see that? But God's word can allow us to see those things ahead of time and flee those things. Now, if you turn over to 1 Timothy chapter 4, and 1 Timothy 4, someone that's wholly given over to something, you know, people, instead of calling someone a drunkard these days, they call them an alcoholic, and instead of calling adultery what it is, oh, they had an affair, and, you know, they, they, they like to take yeah, biblical right. terms that's right. and not use them because they cut right to the point, and you, don't, you can't just mush them around, and you can't play with them like silly putty and adjust them. It's... Boom, there it is in God's infallible word, and it defines it in such that you can't sugarcoat it. It just exposes it for the vile, filthy practice that it is. And it's, it's the exposer of those things. I wish that 
Miller Low Life and Make a Loser and all those booze <laughs> industries, they spend millions, hundreds of millions of dollars on advertisement. And I forgot who it was that was talking about. They don't put their people while they're sitting in their gutter or Jimi Hendrix or those people drowning on their own vomit. Why isn't he the poster child? Here it is. Miller High Life choked on his vomit and slid off into eternity. He doesn't want you to see that. He wants you to see the, the, the pleasures of sin for a season and then stop the, stop the film and get some more victims before people start seeing their lives falling apart. But this book exposes all those things. So, 1 Timothy chapter 4. And we'll start with verse number 5. 1 Timothy 4, 5. He says, for every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving or with received with thanksgiving for it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. But if thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things, thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished up in the words of faith and of good doctrine whereunto thou hast attained, but refuse profane and old wives fables and exercise thyself rather unto godliness for bodily exercise profiteth little, but godliness is profitable unto all things, having promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation. Therefore, we both labor and suffer reproach because we trust in the living God, who is the Savior of all men, especially those that believe. These things command and teach. Let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believer in word in conversation, Amen. in charity, in spirit, in faith, in purity. Amen, you remember that guy in, in 1 John, I think it is? He says, let us not love in word and in tongue, but in deed and in truth. Yeah. There's a whole lot different than someone, a father or a mother, who's saying something and doing something different. It's just like Jesus rebuked those Pharisees in Matthew 23, 1. He said, the scribes and Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. Whatsoever they bid you, that observe and do. But do you not after their works? For they say, That's and they right. do not. Right. And hypocrisy, when children see hypocrisy, they just want to say, I don't want anything to do with that. Yeah. Where if you do something as a parent and it's not right, to be able to apologize to your, your child and say, here's what the verse said and I wasn't, uh, you know, what I did was not right, and this book corrected me, and I'm sorry for being that example. It can cut through that pride and rebellion in a youngster and realize, huh, dad is subject to this book, and I want to be subject to it too, instead of being proud and stubborn and haughty. But that's what this book can do. So it says, in, in example, in charity, spirit, and purity, and he says, till I come, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine, Neglect not the gift that is in thee, which was given thee by prophecy with the laying on a hand of the presbytery. Meditate upon these things. Give thyself holy. Someone that's a drunk, they're completely given over to that drink. They willingly take it in and it takes over them. And it makes them do stuff that they regret and say stuff they wish they never did. And in Proverbs, it talks about thy mouth shall utter perverse things. Thy eyes behold strange women. And if you can't control your your flesh with the right state of mind, it's hopeless if you start getting an altered state of mind. So I really appreciate the, uh, the booze idol that was hit a little bit last night and yesterday because there's a lot of weak people in life that need the crutch of liquor to get them through life. Yeah. Every single one of us is weak. I've heard people out preaching that say, religion is a crutch for weak people as they're sitting with some beer in their hand. I said, okay, I take point, point taken, but... I know that alcohol is a crutch that's for weak people right. as they try to limp through life because they're damaged, they're hindered, yeah. they have right. problems. And instead of coming to the great physician that has a solution, Amen. they're sitting there with more problems exactly where Satan would want them to be. That's exactly right. And that's why whether your crutch is whatever it may be, while we were yet without strength, while we had no strength, Christ died for the ungodly right. to give the strength and vitality of his word to us yes, as we read, believe it, and trust it and as it works effectually in our hearts. Turn with me to 1 Timothy 3. I mean, we could just read the whole chapter, the whole book of Timothy, but uh, 1 Timothy 3, we'll pick up with verse number 1. 1 Timothy 3, 1. He says, This is a true saying. If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. Now, as we read through this, women, here's what your job is. Think about this. Would you, would you desire your husband to be void of all these character traits? Or would you naturally say, oh, that is exactly what a godly man would be. 
as a child, as you get a little bit older, you'd look at here and say, would I want my father to have these type of attributes, whether they're in an assembly or not? Your heart's desire and yearn for godly women, the aged women or just the godly women or aged men, people that had the qualifications for bishop, deacon, elder. Those qualifications are values that everybody should have, whether you hold a position in an assembly or not. So here come some of those things. He said, a bishop then must be blameless. Would you want a father that's blamable? Hey, you're doing this wrong stuff again. Instead, blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach, not given to wine, no striker, not greedy of filthy lucre, but patient, not a brawler, not covetous. Do you remember in the Old Testament when God set people over the nation Israel, he set up people hating covetousness. I wish there was politicians that had that character today. Yeah. Politicians hating covetousness. Hey, we're going to bribe you. Get out of here. Right. And there was a hatred. It wasn't just, well, I choose not to do that. There was a hatred in the heart, an abhorrence where it wasn't, oh, I'll kind of think about that and, and ponder it. Let me get back to you. It was a hatred and intolerance. And we need to be more intolerant towards the, the temptations of this world and not giving in to those things. He says, verse 4, One that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. For if a man know not, if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? Not a novice, lest being lifted up with pride, he fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must have a good report of them which are without, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. Likewise must the deacon, deacons be grave, not double-tongued, not given to much wine, not greedy of filthy lucre, holding the mystery of the faith in a pure conscience. And let these first be proved. Not just someone that says, hey, I'm the best thing since sliced bread. And then he gets a position and before you know it, you're toast. <laughs> You've got problems. But most men will proclaim their own goodness, but a faithful man who can find this book can find him out and it can fortify the heart and conscience of a man whose heart is open to the things of God and to be able to be molded and formed into that. God is able to have his word do those things. And he talks about the wives. We'll talk about those next or later. But this thing about the character traits here, those are exactly what every one of us need to have, whether we have children or not. And if you're a child, having these character traits, of course, you're not going to have a faithful wife and stuff like that. But it'll give you that foundation to understand what the will of the Lord is and to be able to go toward those things. Turn with me over to Titus chapter number one. Titus one. So we're laying down what a godly man is and the character traits that every father should have. Saved or lost, but of course, you're not going to get the traits out of a lost person. The spirit of God's not dwelling in them. But in Titus chapter number one, and we'll start with verse, we'll start with verse three. Titus one three, he says, "But hath in due times manifested his word through preaching, which is committed unto me according to the commandment of God our Savior, to Titus, mine own son, after the common faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ our Savior. For this cause left I thee in Crete that thou shouldest set in order." The things that are wanting. You look around this world, there are so many things wanting. They're lacking. They don't have the truth or the wisdom of God working in them. He says, uh, set in order the things that are wanting and ordain elders in every city as I have appointed thee. If any be blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children, not accused of riot or unruly, for a bishop must be blameless as a steward of God, not self-willed, not soon angry. Can you see the value of these character traits in a husband? Not soon angry, not self-willed, uh, not given to wine, no striker, not given to filthy lucre, but a lover of hospitality, a lover of good men. And that lover of good men, I can say that actually experiencing that here, and I, I'm so thankful for each and every one of you, instead of walking after the darkness and vanity of your mind, uplifting Christ's word and allowing the word of God to be above our desires and, and our, our, our wants it makes it a, a desire and a, a true blessing and a joy being here. I really appreciate meeting you all. But this lover of hospitality, verse number eight, lover of good men, sober, just, holy, temperate, holding fast the faithful word as he has been taught, 
that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. And I'm here to let you know gainsayers are multiplying rapidly. Oh, yeah. But I know the solution to shut them down. It's this book, Rightly That's Divided, right. hey. and to, that their mouths may be stopped yep. and all the world may become guilty before God. And that's what this book can do. It can prepare us to every good work. So this thing about godly men, Satan wants to cripple, uh, just like Mephibosheth of old. He was born perfectly fine, five years old. He gets damaged and crippled, so he couldn't function like everyone else was functioning. And that's exactly what Satan wants to cripple and damage every young man in here, every old aged man. He wants to cripple and damage every single person in here. And how can we avoid that? With the wisdom and understanding of this book. So not being ignorant of his devices. Now, uh, there is... I, I, can't, I don't have enough time to exhaust different temptations that can come for men. But not only was the lust of the eyes a temptation for Eve, it was definitely a temptation for Adam as well. So in this world, you are going to run into a lot of temptations. There's going to be things, the lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, the pride of life. To, but to be able to control where these little things look, the windows of your soul, the candle of the Lord is uh, the spirit of man is the candle of the Lord searching all the inward parts of the belly. What goes in your eye affects your heart. If you remember Jesus who created all things in Colossians 1, in Genesis 1 also, he knows exactly how our bodies work. He said, not that which cometh out of the body defiles the man, but what goes in. But he said, out of the heart of men proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornication. And one of the first things on the list are sexual type of temptations. And you look at the works of the flesh in Galatians. What's the first thing? Adultery, fornication. You're like, hmm. Let that be a lesson to, lesson to every one of us. What does Satan use? The same old junk. Yeah. Uh, like with Potiphar. Potiphar's wife, whatever her name was, tells Joseph. And she didn't just say, would you like to? It's commanding. Do this. It's just like in Proverbs. They don't say, would you like to come? They say, come with us. Let us lay wait for blood. They don't want to give you any options because they know with the temptation, just boom, and just make a quick decision like Esau. For one morsel of meat. Yeah, here's my birthright. And it was referred to as fornication. Does there be any fornicator as Esau? And what was that? Willing to take an eternal value and blessing. I'm just going to go after this little temporal mm, for now. And let that be a lesson to me and everyone here to be able to watch where our eyes are. I went into a grocery store one time and I didn't know anyone was watching. I had, I think it was my, one of my daughters with me. This guy comes up, he goes, is that your truck out there? I said, yeah, did it roll away or something? He goes, no. He said, I've got a problem with pornography and I figured you could probably help me. And he starts talking about his problems. So I feel like plugging my daughter's ears. I'm like, okay, well, let's keep this PG2 rated. <laughs> so anyway, but I, I got to talk with him. First, I went through the gospel to have him understand what the gospel is and make sure that you're not just trying to clean up some lost person's life. You can clean up your life and still go to hell a little bit shinier than before, but that's not the purpose. Save, number one, and come to the knowledge of the truth, number two. So I was able to take a piece of paper, I had a little pen, and I started writing down. And I would say this, for every man here, just put yourself in that position. Someone comes up, you don't have a Bible, you don't have an app in your phone ready to go, and they say, hey, what verses can you help me with, with me having a hard time watching my eyes? And then say, huh. What would I do? And let that be a motivator to get more verses down. So what I like, we don't have to go to all of them, but in Job 31, verse 1, Job said, I made a covenant with mine eyes. Why then shall I think upon a maid? He watched where his eyes went. I noticed from preaching downtown in Orlando, kind of in the red light district, the, the red light worker gals, they're, not, they're females, they're not ladies, but women, they come out and they might have a question and they will watch your eyes. And if you wear, vary around and you kind of wander with your eyes right away, pff, they know that you're a farce and you don't have any control of yourself. Amen. But when you look them square in the eye and show them about the grace of God and how they can be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth and you look right at the windows of their soul and nowhere else, they know that it's something that they haven't run into that type of influence before. And that's why to be able to have control of these eyes because people look where your eyes go. And little children, they will watch where daddy is looking. They'll look and see. And that verse about in, well, it's Galatians 6, 7, but it matches with um, Numbers 32, 23, I think it is, where it says, and you've sinned against the Lord, be sure your sin will find you out. You can't dabble with sin and it not damage you. 
Yeah. It's going to damage. He's going to put those roots in there. And in, even just how your whole physical body makes up or makeup is, how you start producing hormones when you're holding your wife. And it's natural. God designed it to be right and wholesome. But people, when they see the wrong things or they let lascivious thoughts start to stray, it starts building up chemicals in your body and it fortifies memory of certain things you see and it's just damaging, damaging, damn all the way. So to be able to go in and as it were, it's Numbers 33, 52. When they went into the land, God told that nation Israel, for your own good, go in and destroy all their pictures. And that's what we need to do. We need to be able to cast down the imaginations and every high thing. And those temptations and stuff that have destroyed countless people. We need to be able to stand as pillars and lights in this present world and to be able to help people stray or stay away from going down those ways of not watching where your eyes are going. I don't have time to read Ezekiel 23, but on your own, Ezekiel 23, it talks about Ahola and Aholaba and how they corrupted themselves and pretty much prostituted themselves and down they went and it takes the glamour of sin that you see in movies it strips it away and leaves sin gross and disgusting. And read Psalm, or Ezekiel 23 on your own, and it does that very thing. It strips away the veneer of sin and lasciviousness, and you see it as an abhorrence, and you go, ah, I want nothing to do with that. And that's the glory of this book. It allows you to be able to see into places that you never could vi literally, visibly see with your eyes. When I look and read through Luke 16, and I am so glad that my eyes are never going to experience being down in that in the judgment of God in hell. But you can take the eye, the mind's eye, the spirit of your mind, your understanding, and you can see how God defines where that rich man went to hell and the torments. And he's hoping that his five brethren could get someone could come and give him understanding and light. But I have a look from God's word into those things. And you can see you never have to be able to have your soul in those behind those bars and gates and doors like Jonah chapter 2 talks about that one that Jesus Christ triumphantly came right through in Revelation 1 because he had the keys of hell and of death. He had those power of an endless life and he was tempted in all points like as we are, yet without sin. And that's why when he was tempted, he didn't say split, hoof, beat it, I've got this. He comes with, it's written, it's written, it's written, and Satan couldn't hold up against that. So for children, what do children need to memorize? They need to have in their mind, it is written, it is written, it is written. <laughs> and from a child, they can be fortified. I, I was out in Montana one time, and this, the pastor's son, some guys that were teenagers around the same age, said, hey, are you coming with? We're going to go over such and such a place. He goes, no, I'm not coming. And they said, well, why? He said, because the son left himself, bringeth his mother to shame. And I thought, whoa, why did I not know that verse when I was younger? But to be able to have that verse, and I don't, maybe they're going to go do something that wasn't too bad, but the temptation and the possibility of them going the wrong direction was stopped dead in its tracks. And I just rejoice for the power that the scripture can give when it's yielded to, because it can keep us from all those pitfalls. Now, if you want to take your Bible over to, uh, it was mentioned a bunch and you don't have to go there, but in Matthew 5, verse 28, Jesus said, Whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. And these eyes, it doesn't matter how old you are. I talked to an old saint in Florida. I think he was about 90 years old at the time. So he says, hey, Brother Sam, does youthful lust kind of go away after you're about 46? He goes, no. They just kind of like a chameleon and they change. And I was like, ah. Oh. But they just, they, they creep and they change. Their ways are movable that thou canst not know them. But this book knows every one of them and can deliver us from those things. But what goes in your eye affects your heart. And in a good level, when God looked down in Genesis 11 and saw what, what mankind, they're working for destruction. I, his eye affected his heart so much, he came down and did something about the problem in Genesis 11. He confounded their language and stopped that mess. Genesis 6, he looked down, let us go down. And he came down and did something about the debauchery and horrible wickedness going on in Genesis 6. He put it to an end. And in Lamentations 3.51, it says, Mine eye affecteth mine heart. And thanks be to God that God's eye affected him so much. He took on a visible, physical body. The fullness of the Godhead bodily came down and God with us died on Calvary's cross. Shed God's diaglobin on Calvary's cross. 
to redeem us and give us a plan and a purpose and wisdom how to function and direct our lives here and in that world which is to come. So turn with me to 2 Corinthians 10. We have heard it and we might as well look at it again because repetition is the key to learning. And if all you're going to do is preach something that no one else mentioned, well, you're not... So many things were mentioned. It's such a joy because you can allow your mind to just roll through all the different messages and the truths. It's just a, a, a sheer blessing and a delight having been here. And the luxury of a fallible memory can go back and then hear them again. And then I'm going to have to listen to them a couple of times. In fact, if my phone holds out, I'd like to listen to them. I could listen to them a couple of times probably on the way home. All right, so we're going over to... Uh, let's see. I, I said where to go, right? Okay, excellent. Preach it. All right, 2 Corinthians 10. And let's look at verse number 3. 2 Corinthians 10, verse 3. It says, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of what? So when those giants... Not only were they frightening with their, just their physical capabilities, sitting in strongholds, what was able to pull them down? God's people with a belief of God's word, believing what God promised them, they went in and down comes those walls. And it shook a ripple effect through the enemies like, they took them down, we're going to be next. Because they're coming through the land with stride and no one's holding them back. They're accomplishing that purpose that God had for that land, they're coming through. So verse number... Five, it says, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. You know, I can't help think about casting without thinking of fishing. You, know, you take a big suic or if you're going for musky or whatever you're going for and just take that imagination and then cut the string off. And then you think, well, wow, and then there's no coming back. The bridge is gone, but casting it down. And that's why if you can take that thing and just get rid of that thing as fast as you can without weighing and say, I wonder if maybe just make that decision with the mind of Christ. No, and keep going. But casting those things down and having everything subject to the obedience of Christ. And that's what makes a strong man. It makes a strong, godly woman that can grow up to be a strong, aged woman to be able to help fortify the, the young ladies against all the opposition that is coming against them in this world. Now, I think about a few things that I've known some people that got shipwrecked, but even music. Music was mentioned a fair amount. But music, and it doesn't matter what the, the name or the flavor is, anything that has a syncopated beat that has an accent in the downbeat, old uh, Chuck Berry, if it's got a backbeat, he can use it. Right. Satan uses that backbeat because it's powerful, and I don't have time to go through the whole thing about music, but that backbeat and that pounding of the drums went right along with the human sacrifice that came right through Cain's generation, where Tubal Cain, uh, the artificers of brass and of iron, they made those musical instruments, and their children would dance and they would chant to the noise of the vial as they're in open rebellion to the God who gave them life. And you see that stuff go right into Genesis 11 with cannibalism and Babylon worship. And you see it go through the Druids with the British Isles and all their wicked depravity and going after innocent blood. It went down to Haiti through all those people with the voodoo. It's that same beat that pounded through the Congo with the cannibals doing that stuff. So when you hear, I don't care if it's a, a gospel quartet that's got the hot lead stride style piano player. It's all working on that same syncopated satanic beat that helps just lull you to sleep and allow your flesh to get a little extra reviving to fight against the spirit. So when I hear any kind of syncopated rock beat, what helps me is I say, oh, there's some more satanic cannibal pedophile music. And instead of my flesh going, yeah, it's like, ugh. And you know, as they're just like in that valley of the son of Hinnom, where they would pound those drums to drown out the cries of those little children being sacrificed to Moloch. When my flesh wants to get a little bit, I think of that and say, whoa, cast that thing down. Because it's ungodly and it can get your mind to go the wrong direction. When people sing about rocking out, getting lost in the music, uh huh, it allows your conscience to be defiled and lost. And it gets your mind and your, your feet and stuff to start wandering and straying in directions that you don't want to go. So I, don't, I can't go too long on that one, but music is powerful. And that's why music in a good form. 
the psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, little children learning to sing praises with the voices that God gave them, using their voices and their talents and their abilities to sing praise to God and maybe play with some, not with my guitar skills, but playing skillfully with a loud voice. That is the apex and glorification of God working through our bodies, those psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs for his glory and his praise. But instead of drifting away, having good music keep you in that right path. That's important. So um, about ladies, we don't even have to talk about temptations that come for ladies because they don't get tempted by anything, right? <laughs> they're not in the target. And they're like, no, Satan's like, they are immune. I don't even have to do anything with them. No, they're just as much in target. Now, I had a friend of mine, or well, actually my cousin, and he didn't think anything. He was a delivery guy, and he, had, he biked a lot, so his legs were very large because they had to be because he did a lot of bike riding. And he had his shorter shorts on, and some people from our church years ago, they said, they mentioned those things are pretty short. Oh, pff, no, and it, it's not a big thing. It's just your leg, and it's no big deal. So he dropped a package into some place one time, and the gal that was there to receive the package whistles at him and told him that he had nice legs. And it stopped him. He's like, hmm. So he pondered, and then he started covering up his flesh a little bit more. But it's sad because I was reading some statistics about men looking at things they shouldn't be looking at, and the statistics of women looking at things that they shouldn't be looking at and bad things are ramping up, skyrocketing. And that is really sad. But what does Satan have? The same old junk. And just like down in Ephesus, they put up their gods and hardly any of them have any clothes on. And they just put them up 24-7. Now, I mean, I'm glad that in America that's getting worse, but they don't have their pornography set in stone erected 24-7. Some places might. But it's on screens, it's on devices and different things like that. But this nation, as it slides downhill faster and faster, we need to not be ignorant of those devices and have our willing mind fixed on this book Amen. so we don't become shipwrecked. Amen. Now, this thing about shipwreck for younger ladies. If Satan could get a young lady to be corrupted, to be shipwrecked, to be deviated from the, the course and plan that God would have, down goes the potential for being a godly lady in for the family. And he knows exactly where to hit. He likes to hit when they're young. And that's why if you could have taken Og, king of Bashan, or Goliath, or Saph, or the one that almost killed David, Ishbi, Benob, all those giants, they struck fear by their very presence. But when they're one year old, you could just come up and go, and that's the end of Goliath. But after he grew up and was fortified and started learning techniques of war and battle, everyone straightened in fear, and even Saul himself. He was afraid. He was head and shoulders above everyone else, and he didn't want to go out after him. But here comes David. That He referred to David as a stripling, not before his face, but after he won that battle, we might look at it later. Instead of calling him a stripling, he said youth. He didn't call him stripling to his face because David, as a youth, was fit for the battle. He went out, and his youth wasn't despised. His youth was looked at, observed, and it was marveled upon that his faith in God was able to do work and and win battles that were unparalleled to anyone else, anything else that anyone had been doing before that. All right, so this thing about young ladies, I happen to have a fair amount of them in the back. But little young ladies, when you think about young men and how they would treat the aged women, and when it comes to the younger women, treat them as sisters with all purity. So I think about that, and you think, well... As you're, I mean, as a, a potential spouse or a suitor starting to know a lady, I would not, I have two sisters, I wouldn't go walking around and say, hey, to my sister, can I walk with you and we walk around Walmart and holding hands? I'm not interested in holding your hand. I mean, if you need help up from somewhere, but I'm not going to hold your hand romantically if we walk around the neighborhood or something because there's more involved there. But little daughters, little girls, they need to have their hearts guarded. And they don't know how to guard them or their heart on their own, so they need fathers and mothers that have wisdom. And instead of having their emotions revved up, when he talks about there's a difference between a wife and a virgin. Virgins should not be being stirred up in a passionate emotional sense. Where they have this one guy is getting to know him and he's stirring them up and they all give part of their heart over here and part of their heart over there. It should be you have your heart guarded and you find out there's a man that's godly and things work together. He's got his mind in the right place. Then you can have your emotion and all that kind of stuff with your husband. It's in the right spot. But what does Satan do? He takes emotional and marriage relationship, tries to jump the gun, have it before, and takes something that's perfectly fine in its right place, 
and he twists it and makes it something that's not right. So young girls having their hearts protected, reading love novels and all that stuff, that is not beneficial at all. It's getting their emotions, getting corrupted in their mind and, and their, their desires are going the wrong way. If you remember, uh, anyone remember that gal, that younger lady, she went out to see the daughters of the land. Remember her name? Dinah, yep. She went out to see the daughters of the land. What's, what's any harm in that? And then Shechem, I think his name was Shechem, saw her and defiled her. And her life was changed forever. And that's why we can learn from these things and protection of those young, valuable little lives. And not just letting them get drug up, but trained up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. But godly women be able to keep and preserve them. I know too many folks where they take their young daughters like, well, we got to send them to dance class. And off they go, and it's sad because the, what they're learning how to wiggle around is not what a chaste young lady would do. As they're learning how to do all these little wiggles and stuff, and they're not clothed properly, what is going on with this crazy stuff? I mean, I guess maybe in one sense, if things, they weren't able to keep a job somewhere else, they could always go to the low-life club and get a job. But that's not the goal. Our goal isn't to put out people who know how to wiggle and tempt men and be profane with the bodies that, that God gave them, but to be able to keep those and have them be chaste, protected, and for the service of God, and have them deal with real things, not having a life of screen where they're telling their friends all their emotions, and they keep it all. They don't tell their mom and dad what they think, but they'll tell their friends, I feel this way, and I want to do this. And when it comes to their parents, they're all, mm, and they don't even know what they're doing. But we need to keep that close, open uh, communication where children, you can communicate with the parents and parents to the children and to be able to guard those things. And screens, I've seen so many children destroyed with the screen. Yes. And it's that, it, I don't have time to go there, but in Ezekiel 8, there's that hole in the wall. And they look to the little hole and you see every abomination and wickedness you can imagine was in that little hole, that little window. And these little windows here, unrestrained and ungoverned is that same thing. Every abominable, wicked thing that's in there and children can get damaged and, and, and toxified so fast where they're damaged and they got images in their mind. They wish they could get rid of them. But we need to be able to be wise and keep these damaging potentials away from them and to be able to have them understand what God's will and, and will is for their life. Now, if you... Uh, I don't, each one of these points could be a whole message, but training young women and having them grow up and learn real things, how to keep house, how to learn the scripture, how to be able to be a godly woman and a godly wife in the future, or at least be a godly lady with her life service in service to God. Now I'm going to cruise on down to young men. Of course, I know more about being a young man and not that I'm one anymore, but if you take your Bible and turn over to Titus chapter two. There are instructions to keep men from getting sidetracked where they're, you know, they're the best gamer on whatever. But playing games, when you look at the, the games that they had, or they, they ate and drank and rose up to play in Psalm, I think it's 106, their play consisted of something that was not good at all. And I never knew the terms, but I knew a guy that grew up in the hood, and he talked about like whoremongers in that area, they called them players. And I thought, that's interesting, because my grandpa was born in 1921, the same year as Ruckman. And he used to refer to the, the people that were ungodly and immoral, they referred to as swingers or players even way back then. And I thought, huh. So anyway, let's go over to Titus chapter 2. You're already, already there, I think. I'm always leading up the back here. In Titus chapter 2. But this thing about guarding where your eyes are going and being prepared and being trained with a purpose and goal in mind. Titus 2 and look at verse number 6. Titus 2, 6. It says, Young men likewise exhort to be sober-minded. When you get youth together and you just over, you overhear what young men are talking about in the world, it is almost 100% vanity and vexation of spirit. It just when they don't have a governor or a tutor over them, they just spin out and shipwreck and they talk about stuff that is a shame to do. So he says, young men exhort to be sober minded in all things, sowing thyself a pattern of good works in doctrine, showing uncorruptness, gravity, sincerity, sound speech that cannot be condemned, that he that is the contrary part may be ashamed, having no evil thing to say of you. Exhort servants to obedient unto their own masters and to please them well in all things, not, or not answering again. 
So the exhortation of young men be sober and to be able to be an example of uncorruptness and in doctrine showing uncorruptness and gravity and sincerity. Young men, we can get young men together and they have this where they're exhorting one another in these aspects. You are going to get some soldiers that would have been just like Shama and David's mighty men in the Old Testament. They're encouraging one another to put off and put on the right things. That is powerful. And I love to be around young people and hopefully be an encouragement to them. Now, this thing about uh, diligence and discipline. Young men, time where you're wasting time with playing or looking at video stuff or just, we need to be able to invest our time and learn, teach young men how to work, how to be diligent. Have a little schedule. And the little guy, he can learn how to be diligent and help with things around the house. He can learn Bible from his youth and be prepared. And about laboring diligent and be able to endure hardness. Give them hard little tasks with, within their capabilities. But so they can learn those things and work with their hands. So not only can they work with their hands physically, they can be those workmen that need not to be ashamed. Taking this book and from a child, knowing truths that we sadly didn't find out to her a whole lot later on in life. But have that next generation laden up so that their life and their whole life live for God can be wonderful, great just like Solomon was hoping for that temple when he was going to build. Now, if you turn over to, um, let's go to 1 Samuel 17. Since we mentioned about David, 1 Samuel 17, and we're running toward the end here. 1 Samuel 17. So David, of course, the sweet psalmist of Israel with the words of Christ and, and understanding what God's plan was for that nation Israel and having his heart tuned you could see his desires and the affection of his heart. So 1 Samuel 17, and pick up with me at verse number 56. This is getting toward the latter part of his actions here with, um, with Goliath of Gath. He said, um, 1 Samuel 17, and let's see, well... Well, let's look at verse number 20, 1720. So here's, here's a, a young man, and what did he do? He just left his sheep, and I'm just going to go wandering off. No, nope. he says, look at David rose up early in the morning and left the sheep with a keeper, and he had a plan. He had a purpose. He didn't just react. He's like, I'm going to go down here, so I'm going to set these things in order, and then go down there. So he goes down, and you start to see character traits of a godly man that was able to bring God's truth to that nation and guide them and bring them through battles and victories. He said, verse number 39, Saul was going to have him go out, and he gives them all his armor. He said, he puts them off. He says, I've not proven them. He puts them off. He goes into battle with the stuff that he'd proved, brings Goliath down. He cuts off his head, verse number 51. And Saul, who was afraid of Goliath, he says, verse number 56, he says, And the king said, Inquire thou whose son this stripling is. And David returned from the slaughter of the Philistines, and Abner took him and brought him before Saul with the head of the Philistine in his hand. And Saul said unto him, Whose son art thou, thou young man? He didn't refer, he had honor, he had dignity, and he was respected by the king because of him going all, and with belief and faith in God's word, he went out and wrought, the, wrought these victories. And young men today can be respectable. They can be sober, they can be just, they can be thinking correctly, and they can be lights in this world where people that are grandparent age, they go look and they see a young man, they go, I've never seen this before. This, this is something different. This is a power and an influence upon this young soul that I haven't seen the likes of for however long it has been. But that's what God's word can do. It can take a young little man and teach him how to be a godly man, how to say, no, I'm not walking this way. No, I am going to do this. I'm going to have diligence and I'm going to allow my vessel to be fit for the master's use. And like David, he served his generation and then he fell on asleep. But he used his body and his abilities to serve his generation. And that's what every one of us need to do. And youth need to realize it's not all about them. It's all about God and this book and his purpose for the heavenly places. So uh, David went out and he was respected. And that's why when it talks about let no man despise thy youth, that's the way you can have men not despise thy youth, by being an example of the believer. Amen. And they look at that character trait and they say, 
This is non-typical, but it, it, it can be typical for God's power to come through. So turn with me over to 1 Thessalonians 4. And we're starting to run down here. Uh, one more thing I wanted to mention about young men with the sober, soberness to them. In Acts 26, where Paul was accused, he says, oh, much learning doth make thee mad. And he didn't get sidetracked and get delayed. He stays right on track. He said, I'm not mad, most noble Festus, but speak forth the words of truth and soberness. And when this world runs into young men who speak forth the words of truth and soberness, they too can start to tremble in the presence of this book working in a, in a, a submitted heart. And that's where that power is. In 1 Thessalonians 4, again, I go telling my little intro and then I don't get over there. 1 Thessalonians 4, 4. Well, look at verse 3. For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that you should abstain from fornication, that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor, not in the lust of concupiscence. And people say, was well, there Cupid in the Bible? Yeah, evil Cupid. <laughs> he's, he's in there. The lust of concupiscence, even as the Gentiles which know not God, that no man go, go beyond and defraud his brother in any matter, because the Lord is the avenger of all such, as we also have forewarned you and testified. For God hath not called us to, un, er, called us to uncleanness, but unto holiness, and, and the whole thing, but it goes down there. But he's called us to holiness and to be those examples of the believer. Now, uh, I have about five more verses, and I don't know if it's going to be too long to go to them. But I could just give you the reference. I guess I could. In, in 1 Chronicles 12, verse 33, the men that were able to fight for that nation Israel, they were not of double heart. And they could keep rank. It didn't say they were rank. They, they, they were of, not of a double heart and they could keep rank. They knew their position and they knew what they were supposed to do and they did it. They didn't get sidetracked. They could keep on track, not of double heart, and they could keep rank. And they would go out and it would keep them in the battle doing what was right. And let, let, I'll turn one more passage. Yeah, one more passage. If you go to 1 Timothy 6. 1 Timothy 6. And then we'll close. So, the fortification of a husband, a wife, and if you're not married, possibly a future husband, a future wife, and children, if you have those qualifications of those bishop, elder, and deacon, the applicable ones, that is a, a character trait of gold that this world wants to destroy and corrupt. All right, there I go again. I got to go here to 1 Timothy. All right, 1 Timothy 6, let's look at verse 6 to start. He says, and this is another thing young people need to learn. But godliness with contentment is great gain. It's not just, uh, but I really want this and I want the trinket and I want the whatever it may be. What has great gain? Godliness. And if parents can exemplify that, what has great gain? The big whatever it is that has huge monthly payments and compounding interest? Uh-uh. Godliness with contentment, and it's something you can have as a present possession, is great gain, for we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out, but God can lay it forward for us. He says, in having food and raiment, let us therewith be content. But they which will be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition, for the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrow. But thou, O man of God, flee these things and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life whereunto thou art also called and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. I give thee charge in the sight of God who quickeneth all things and before Jesus Christ who before Pontius Pilate witness a good confession, that thou keep this commandment without spot, unrebukable until the appearing of the Lord of our Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah. Unrebukable and without spot, that's God's plan for every one of us. 
And this book, working in our heart and submitted, it brings that thing forth. It brings it to fruition. He says, which, is, which in his times he shall show who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, who only hath immortality, dwelling in the light which no man can approach unto, whom no man hath seen nor can see, to whom be honor and power everlasting. Amen. Amen. Charge them that are rich in this world that they be not high-minded nor trust in uncertain riches, but, unto the, but in the living God who giveth us richly all things to enjoy. They that do good, or they that do good, that they do good, that they be rich in good works, ready to distribute, willing to communicate. And if you're communicating good works, is you've got a surplus of it. And have lives that have such a surplus, you can bless everyone you run into. And you can serve your generation. Laying up in store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come, that they may lay hold on eternal life. O Timothy, keep that which I committed unto the, the, uh, unto thy trust, avoiding profane and vain babblings in opposition of science falsely so called, and then talks about on the rest. So, coming to a conclusion, having faithful men, faithful women, and exemplifying reality. Where is the primary thing? Where is something of value? This book in the service of God and protecting those little youth. Turn off the junk, and it's called programming for a reason. Yes, sir. It is programming. It I is. don't have time to go into the silent sound spread spectrum, but it was patented back in 1984, and it was for the purpose of conveying messages with people not knowing what was going into their mind and in their hearts. That's right. And the article I read about this is, don't, be, don't think it's strange that people that you knew or thought you knew start changing their, their thoughts and their views start changing radically after they're exposed to these influences. Yes. And the God of this world, he's not going to say, oh, well, that's too far. I'm not going to go there. He's going to capitalize everything he can to corrupt this mind. Yes. Right. And if we can have just like Achish, when he said correctly about David, he said, David would be a keeper of mine head. What can keep our head? This book and the mind of Christ. Amen. And that's why if we can have it just like in, uh, in Job or in Psalm, he says, but they, they there, I think it's in Job, that they be in one mind and who can turn them? And that's what we need to have. Children that aren't going to turn aside after Satan, who have been able to endure hardness as a good soldier and shine brightly. So godly men, women, children, knowing our roles and allowing this book to prepare us to every good work so God will be glorified and people can say, that is something I haven't seen the likes of. They've got something I don't have. And it doesn't take much these days to stand out as a peculiar person. So anyway, I'm very thankful to God for equipping us and giving us everything that is required to live godly for him. So I'll close in a word of prayer, and I am very thankful for the opportunity to be here. God, we praise your word. We praise you for the things that you've done. We thank you for triumphing on Calvary's cross and winning a victory that we never collectively could even think of accomplishing. But we thank you for accomplishing it, and we thank you that we can be of your flesh and of your bones. And as members, one of particular, in your body, to be able to encourage one another in the most holy faith, to encourage one another to fight and war and strive for the mastery, and make every blow and every footstep we take uh, valuable and something that's for the cause and glorification of our Lord Jesus. Thank you for this opportunity where your word could edify us. Thank you for the different saints who have been studying and had encouraging and beneficial things from your word to encourage our inner man. We thank you for them and we pray that it would never get old, but that we would remind ourselves constantly of these truths so that we could walk worthy of that vocation that you have and give, that you've given to us. Amen. We thank you for this opportunity to live the rest of our lives in praise and honor to thee and may we encourage one another to do so for the greatest glory of the blessed and only potentate, our Amen. Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Yeah. All right, well, I, I'm so thankful to be here. I know my family is too. And Amen. I, these, this time has definitely been, as it were, the days of heaven upon the earth. So Amen. I appreciate it much. We love you, buddy. Bless you, brother. Absolutely. Uh,